Hello my friends, my name is Artur Rey and I am an Estonian YouTuber. US Army, not nowadays, but World War I and World War II. Today we're going to research what it looked like, how it behaved, how it acted, and I personally want to know if there's any similarities with the Roman tactics, because US has much been compared with the Romans. A big power, it doesn't consist of one nation. For example, Estonia is a national country. You're Estonian, you're part of Estonian country. If you're American, that means you can be everybody from the world. Like, it's the mixing pool, right? As were the Romans back then. So I want to know if there's something similar. I can also compare it to my own experience, because I served in the Kuperianov Infantry Battalion. Yeah, this is the second uh, brigade. This is the school of Kuperianov, and I was Private Ray. Yeah. So let's see what the US Army has in common. Now the Second World War. Faction. The US Army. Mm. World War II. Yeah. Before the war had started, the US Army was a small professional force. When Germany overran Poland within a matter of weeks in 1939, a greater urgency was put on building up the numbers in the army. A small professional force. So you want to say that after World War I even, US didn't build up great in numbers. Well, yeah, I remember in history, actually, it was only after World War II that they truly got involved in the world. Before that, they were kind of sticking to their own, you know, American continent, right? If you're American, you can disapprove or approve of this. As I remember, they only after World War II that they had to be involved, or they wanted to, they got involved with the whole world, and then the whole spreading some good old American freedom started, yeah? Stone a flag already envisioned by the Rainbow Plan. In 1940, the United States introduced selective conscription, requiring registration of all men between 21 and 35, and by 1941, the U.S. Army had grown to 1.5 million men. Ooh. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, declaring war on the U.S., with Germany and Italy declaring war a few days later. The sleeping giant had been awoken. The U.S. Army expanded greatly as a result. The sleeping giant has been awoken. Yeah, I mean, look what happens now. It's all an outcome of that event. U.S. was minding his own business. No care in the world. Don't care about the world. But now suddenly, boom, we're going to spread the freedom. Have you spread the freedom already? The world needs your American freedom. Spread it. From both volunteers and increased conscription. The Japanese forces invaded the Philippines on December 8, 1941, and quickly stormed the U.S. and Philippine garrison, led by General Douglas MacArthur, defending it. But major combat operations for the U.S. Army began in 1942. Europe was chosen first as a target because Germany threatened Britain as an ally, which, if invaded, would make future attacks difficult. U.S. troops arrived in Britain and were involved in Operation Torch on November 8, 1942 in Morocco and Algeria, after the Soviet Union requested a second front to relieve the pressure on the Red Army. The U.S. Army then fought against German and Italian forces in Tunisia, followed by an invasion of Sicily. Yeah, in Tunisia, we have played that in Call of Duty 1 and 2, and I think in 5, um, Call of Duty 5, the fifth game of Call of Duty is World at War, so I think all of those three games had Tunisia part in it. It was pretty cool, but I played as pretty. You played as British. You never played as the U.S. soldier on Tunisia, I think. Mainland Italy in 1943. In the Pacific, meanwhile, fighting by the U.S. Army alongside the U.S. Marines and other allies was concentrated around Rabaul and air bases in the Solomon Islands. On the Western Front, General Dwight Eisenhower was in charge of the Allied invasion of Normandy, known as Operation Overlord, in 1944. Oh yeah! On June 6th... I've made many, uh, many, many, many videos about that. Like, I think from, for now I have made seven videos about D-Day, so if you want to just check them out in my channel. Next, D-Day. The U.S. Army landed at Utah and Omaha beaches, where they suffered heavy casualties from the German defenders on the cliffs above. U.S. Rangers also scaled the cliffs at Point du Hoc between Utah and Omaha to destroy the coastal gun battery at the top. U.S. paratroopers, meanwhile, dropped behind the beaches into the occupied France several hours oh, before... I have to cut out the word, the N-word. Cannot really say it. The monetization platform is really 
you know, cutting down channels who even talk about this stuff, so I have to be very careful. For main landings, the U.S. Army would push into the Netherlands fighting German forces during Operation Market Garden and into the Ardennes during the Battle of the Bulge, pushing the army to its limits. In March 1945, they crossed the Rhine and entered into the heartland of Germany in April. By the end of April, the U.S. Army was racing east to Berlin, Vienna, and Prague. In the Pacific, an island-hopping strategy was used, enabling the U.S. Army to take vulnerable, poorly defended islands from the Japanese. Island-hopping strategy, yes, but the Japanese is a different animal. I mean, can't really fight the Japanese man-to-man -man because it's unfair. In war, even, there are rules, meaning that if it goes really bad, you try to get surrender terms or whatever, you know. The Japanese, they didn't give up and they didn't even flee. They fought till they died and they wanted to die in battle for their emperor, so... I mean, it's hard to survive fighting that. Yeah, fighting the Japanese was like, it was different. It, I can't say if it's harder than fighting the Nazis, but it was much different. He's ...supporting the drive to the main islands of Japan. The U.S. Army returned to the Philippines in October 1944 and landed on Okinawa in April 1945, the last major battle of the Pacific Theater. In the Second World War, 10 million soldiers served in the U.S. Army. It is Whoa. estimated that 235,000 were killed and 592,000 wounded. Ooh, 10 million? I think it was about 21 million in Red Army, but 10 million in U.S. Army. I mean, I would have never guessed that it's that much. That was the Second World War, 10 million soldiers. I bet the numbers are much, much smaller in the First World War, but I want to know. Let's find out. U.S. Army, the First World War. In 1914, the United States Army consisted of 98,000 men and... 98,000 men? What the hell? You can do anything with that force. In First World War, millions were battling still, 98,000 men. This is something Estonia could muster even. Actually, Estonia did muster. In 1918, when we beat the Soviet Union in the independence war of Estonia, 1980 to 1920, by the end of that war, Estonia had mobilized almost over 100,000 men. So. Once our army was as big as the U.S. Army, 100 years ago. And on top of this, 27,000 troops in the National Guard. At the end of 1914, General Leonard Wood helped form the National Security League and argued for conscription. President Woodrow Wilson responded to this by increasing the standing army to 140,000 soldiers. When the USA declared war in April 1917, the American Expeditionary Force, or the AEF, was sent to the Western Front under the command of General John Pershing. The Selective Service Act, which was drafted by Brigadier General Hugh Johnson at this time, was passed by Congress. This law authorized President Woodrow Wilson to raise a volunteer infantry force of no more than four divisions. Males between the ages of 21 and 30 were required to register for military service. By September 12, 1918, almost 24 million men had registered, with 4 what? million men eventually drafted into the armed services and had- 4 million men drafted in World War I? Okay, the numbers are big, what the hell? What happened between World War I and II then? Like, they drafted their all, they shipped them to Europe and then they pulled back? No spreading American freedom yet, I see, but after the Second World War it all happened, so... I guess they didn't change their foreign policies after the First World War as much as they did after the second one. Half serving in the war overseas. By July 1918, there were over a million soldiers in France. They would defend the Western Front during the Third Battle of the Aisne in May and at the Marne in June. They would also take part in joint Allied attacks at... So Le by the time of Second World War, Americans had the experience of fighting Germans on European soil. A big time experience. Amal and Canal du Nord, and then finally launched their own offensives at Saint Mihiel and Meuse Argonne. Two million U.S. troops reached Europe, however, a large number arrived too late to participate. Approximately 200,000 African Americans served in the United States Army in Europe, such as the famous Harlem Hellfighters. Harlem Hell. You can. The row here seemed like they made separate fighting divisions out of African Americans, not mixing them with everybody else. I don't know if it's, that's true, I just, 
assume it right now. Maybe it's just they mixed with everybody, which would be a nice thing to do, but I don't know. Because of segregation, they would fight with the French army during the war. Oh, Overall, okay. the American Expeditionary Force suffered 264,000 casualties during the war, with an estimated 112,500 deaths. Yeah, casualties means wounded, missing, or dead. Uh, dead means dead. So if, if you hear casualties, that doesn't mean they died. That means they might be wounded also. I don't know if they use it politically correctly nowadays, but back then it meant that. So 4 million men at the time of World War I, then it went down, of course, into war periods, the crazy 30s. Then the 40s came to World War II, and by the end of that, 10 million men were conscripted in the US Army. And after that, I guess it went down, but I don't think it went down that much, because US then had to spread the freedom to everybody. So they needed the men, they needed the bases. Nowadays, US has over 600 foreign bases, military bases around the world, which is insanely crazy. And talking about the Romans in the US, the Romans and America nowadays have very much in common. And I think the will, US will end up like the Romans did. Big empire lasting for a long time, the most powerful in the world, and then it implodes, meaning it will just collapse on its own might, which happens to all big empires. But yeah, US is that young, it's only like four, three, four hundred years. You got more time, don't worry. Spread the freedom, no need to fear the end right now. Well, 1918, we had over 100,000 men. Uh, one time in history, yes, proud about that. If you like these videos, please support the channel on Patreon. The link is in the description below, and PayPal also, whichever works for you. And as always, my friends, until my next video, stay cool and bye bye.